Dzień dobry, witam Państwa serdecznie na kolejnym seminarium naukowym Instytutu Pileckiego. Nazywam się Emilia Dziewiecka i jestem pracownikiem Ośrodka Badań nad Totalitaryzmami. Gościmy dzisiaj pana doktora Jakoba Halwa z Bieren z Muzeum Narodowego Danii, który przedstawi temat ograniczenia akcji pomocowych Dania i Żydzi Europejscy. Nasz prelegent uzyskał stopień naukowy doktora w Kopenhaskiej Szkole Biznesu oraz w Archiwum Narodowym Danii na podstawie badań nad próbami wprowadzenia przez Niemców w życie teorii aryjskości na obszarze Danii w czasie II wojny światowej. Aktualnie prowadzi badania postdoktorskie nad tematem niemiecko-duńskiej szkoły w Kopenhadze, St. Petris Schule w latach 1930-1950. Jest także autorem dwóch książek edukacyjnych. Pierwsza z nich dotyczy Holokaustu, a druga świadomości duńskiego społeczeństwa na temat prześladowania Żydów w okresie II wojny światowej. Koreferentem będzie dr John Purnell, pracownik naukowy Ośrodka Badań nad Totalitaryzmami. Szanowni Państwo, wystąpienie odbędzie się w języku angielskim, także jest możliwość skorzystania z tłumaczenia. Aby aktywować tłumaczenie, należy w dolnym pasku wybrać opcję tłumaczenie ustne, a następnie wybrać język polski. I również zachęcam Państwa serdecznie do zadawania pytań naszym prelegentom. Pytania będą przeze mnie odczytywane po zakończonym wystąpieniu. Teraz już oddaję głos panu doktorowi Bierę. Bardzo proszę. So thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. I hope everything works as it should and that you can see my screen. Uh, so I would first like to thank the Pilecki Institute for inviting me here today. Uh, some of you may know that I was supposed to have participated in the conference hosted by the Institute that was called The Choice to Save Lives. But unfortunately, I had to cancel due to uh, illness. But the Pilecki Institute has been so kind and asked me to join you today. So I thank you very much for that kindness and invitation. And also thank you to the uh, translators and organizers of this uh, seminar today. The overall theme of my talk here today will mostly be on diplomats uh, failing to rescue Jews, except if they were Danish uh, citizens, and even then it appeared uh, quite difficult. Uh, the main question I wish to answer is what was it that restrained Denmark and its diplomats from taking action in this area? Why did Denmark not have uh, Raoul Wallenberg like Sweden did? And throughout my presentation, I will probably be comparing uh, Denmark a little bit to uh, Sweden. And to answer this question, we must go through a four-step background and analysis cycle. Um, so if I can just change my slide here, here we go. Um, because first we need to get a grasp on Denmark's relationship to Germany, both before the war and within the realm of occupied Europe, because it sets the framework for how Danish diplomacy was maintained and how it functioned uh, in this period. Um, I will also provide a brief overview of which Danish diplomatic representations were actually functioning within the occupied zone of occupied Europe. Um, and secondly, we need to understand Denmark's diplomatic role uh, and its relation to the subject of the uh, European Jews. This would be one of the briefer points of my uh, presentation. And when we have these two points set, then we'll lead into my third section where I attempt to analyze the restraints of rescue um, in regards to what the diplomats uh, thought they could actually do. Um, and lastly, I will give a few examples 
of the uh, rescue attempts that were actually made and where the perceived restraints of the diplomats were actually um, broken. Um, as Amelia so kindly mentioned in the uh, introduction, uh, I wrote a book and my uh, presentation is based on the research I did for my book on Danish diplomatic knowledge of the Holocaust from 1938 to 1945. I should stress that only the legations, diplomatic legations within occupied Europe has been examined thoroughly. And this means some rescue attempts, for example, from Danish legations in Switzerland and Portugal actually still remain accounted for. Um, I will mostly be focusing on the time frame from 1940 and onwards, but I will also relate some events and ideas before 1940. I've chosen 1940 because Denmark was occupied from the 9th of April 1940. And of course, that changed how Danish diplo diplomacy functioned. Um, it's my experience that uh, Denmark's experiences, be both before and during the Second World War, rarely cause crosses borders because of the uh, language barrier. And therefore, of course, I will have to commit some time to these aspects of Denmark's newer history uh, to those of you who are unfamiliar with Denmark in this period. And I suspect that is most of you. Um, I hope I wasn't too judgmental, but, <laughs> but Denmark <laughs> is not that large a country, so it doesn't um, take up that much space in most people's minds outside of Denmark, I think. That's my experience, at least. Um, so I briefly first need to explain that uh, Danish diplomacy was shaped by the idea that Denmark's state of affairs was highly dependent on its relationship to its southern neighbor, uh, Germany. And this has also, this has been termed as the German school within the the Danish foreign ministry. And it, this German school was shaped by Denmark's defeat in 1860-46, uh, uh, where Denmark lost about one third of its area to Germany due to a war between the two countries. Um, Denmark lost the two fiefdoms, Schleswig and Holstein, which you can see on the slide at the moment. So Denmark was reduced to the green area, basically. Um, at the same time, uh, this German school made sure that Denmark was very adamant not to enter into armed conflicts in Europe, where the major uh, European states were participating. So Denmark was successful in this policy during World War I, where it um, succeeded in remaining neutral and selling goods to both the Triple Alliance, but also to the Entente. So both sides of the war basically could buy Danish goods. And uh, prominent members and ministers of the Danish foreign ministry were guided by these experiences and ideas that actually go back to 1864. And of course, the success of neutrality in the First World War um, shaped a lot of the ideas in the 1930s. Um, in um, 1920, there was a plebiscite, um, and that was held in uh, the, the areas uh, or the fiefdom Schleswig that you see on your screen at the moment. And uh, Denmark regained a smaller portion of its uh, former territory again, but it also gained a small German uh, minority. So you have the combination of the German school within the foreign ministry and the German minority in the border. And this meant that Denmark would go to very great length, lengths not to provoke Germany in the 19. Uh, 30s. So if we move up to that period, um, from 1937, uh, this, 
this policy of not provoking uh, Germany became a top priority um, because the British refused to assist uh, Denmark. And as you all probably know, German had begun to reclaim former German territory lost after the Second World War due to the Versailles Treaty. And of course, you just saw that Denmark also regained the small territory of Germany, even though it did not participate in the war. Uh, with the Munich Agreement in the fall of 1938, Denmark became even more nervous and thought that a non-aggression pact would be the wisest choice for Denmark. So it entered into one in, um, in May of 1939. Um, this pact ended on April 9th, 1940, as Germany attacked Denmark in the early hours of April 9th. Um, and now we sort of move on to what kind of relationship then uh, occurred between uh, Denmark and Germany. Um, Denmark surround, surrendered after only a few hours, and then Denmark accepted a formal relationship with Germany despite uh, being uh, occupied. Uh, similar agreements were actually extended to Norway, Belgium, the Netherlands, but Denmark was the only one to accept this sort of uh, proposal. So contrary to most other countries, Denmark would deal directly with the German Foreign Office in matters relating to the uh, occupation. Um, the cooperation between Denmark and its occupier broke down in August 1943, and I just have a new English newspaper clipping uh, that I've titled August 29th, 1943. So you can see that that was when it broke down. It broke down due to a lot of civil unrest and strikes. And this was followed up by German demands to forbid strikes, but also to introduce the death penalty for acts of sabotage in Denmark. And the Danish government stepped down uh, facing these demands. But for a little more than three years, Denmark maintained control over the government. The police, the courts, and even the Danish military was actually allowed to remain in place despite being occupied by Germany. Of course, this couldn't happen without giving in to certain German demands. And I just want to give you uh, one example of these. Uh, Germany placed a lot of pressure on Denmark to sign the anti common turn pact in 1941, and the country did so. And then afterwards, Denmark outlawed the Communist Party. But at the same time, Denmark also succeeded in making it voluntary for Danes to join German ranks, rather than being conscripted directly to the German army. And this is a typical example in Danish occupation history of what has been termed a Faustian bargain. And that means uh, to make an agreement with the devil by accepting one bad option over another terrible option. So in this case, by accepting a lesser evil, by avoiding forced conscription, but at the same time giving in on a diplomatic principle by outlawing the Communist Party. So the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs was the main link to the occupiers, and most communication took place through these two ministries, but many main minor and practical matters were solved without the involvement of the ministry. So this arrangement uh, is still up for debate. In international research, uh, Danish diplomatic status during the occupation of the country is still debated and it's often classified in various ways. So it's either being classified as neutral or uh, belligerent. Uh, and most Danish historians also argue that Denmark was not at war with Germany. And instead, Denmark is often described as, and these would be the uh, historiographical terms, um, as neutral, neutral occupied or as being peacefully occupied. Uh, it's also termed the 
peaceful occupation or the fiction of neutrality. Um, and Denmark was also by com contemporaries uh, outside of Denmark uh, viewed as a special case compared to the rest of uh, occupied Europe. And this arrangement has also caused continuous discussion uh, within Danish historiography. The most dominant term remains cooperation, while collaboration has been applied by some historians. Uh, recently, it seems the terms collaboration and cooperation have been sort of equated in, uh, in Danish research. So even within Danish historiography, there's been some debate on how to evaluate and categorize this agreement between the two countries. And to further complicate things, it has recently been argued that uh, the Danish political actors of the period presented Denmark's status in a diplomatically flexible manner. And these were neutral, non-belligerent, peacefully occupied or belligerent. And the application of these terms depended on the developments of the war. So for example, neutrality was mostly used in the beginning of the war, while being a belligerent was used by Danish political actors to side with the allies at the very end of the war. So you could say it was a sort of opportunist use of these uh, diplomatic terms. Um, the Danish-German agreement uh, does resemble other forms of relationships between Germany and other European countries during the Second World War. Uh, and several theoretical attempts have been made to define and categorize both occupied collaborationist neutral or allied states in order to point to differences and similarities. But depending on the theory applied, Denmark changes uh, category. And this just underscores that Denmark's relation to Germany during the occupation remains difficult to define in an accurate manner. Um, and this holds true from a, both a diplomatic viewpoint as well as from theories attempting to define the roles of Europe's countries in relation to national socialist uh, Germany. So in order to contain these many differing viewpoints, I would argue that Denmark during the entire occupation period had traits, traits that were similar to those found in both occupied neutral and belligerent countries. But it, depending on what time period you look at, Denmark would have one or two features that would be dominant. So I would argue you might want to view Denmark as a hybrid instead of being one or the other. Um, I'll not go further into this discussion here, but just exemplify my argument. In 1940, uh, Denmark appears much like neutral Sweden. In 1940, there was practically no resistance in Denmark. Uh, companies were exporting to Germany and they did so without fearing retaliatory measures. And you had a functioning Danish government in place. In 1944, Denmark appears much more like occupied Norway, for example. Denmark's government had stepped down. The bureaucracy still functioned but factories and others producing for the German war effort would at this point fear uh, resistance efforts to disrupt or destroy this sort of production. So you have two very different Denmarks, depending on what time period you, you look at. Um, so the cooperative agreement between Denmark and Germany is a complex and fluid construction but it also allowed Denmark to maintain its diplomatic uh, representations throughout the world. Uh, here I focus on um, Europe. So in most German occupied countries, which are the blue ones, uh, you can see that Denmark maintained diplomatic representations. Uh, what at the time was called Gesandtschafts in German, what we would call embassies today, were turned into general consulates, but they maintained the same staff level 
and they almost contained or continued working as uh, usual. Uh, the most important uh, legations, I would argue, were in Berlin, but also in neutral Stockholm. You can see the neutral countries are marked by orange on the map uh, on the screen right now. Um, Berlin and Stockholm would function as information hubs for exchanges of information and messages were usually forwarded through these diplomatic entities to the main office in Copenhagen. However, the Danish diplomatic service broke into two separate entities as diplomats who were located in allied or neutral countries increasingly formed an independent unit. Uh, this happened first in North and South America and most notably by the Danish diplomat Henrik Kaufmann, who was the Danish envoy to the United States. In April 1941, he signed over Greenland to American protection. And this split the diplomatic corps into two separate entities. Those who remained loyal to the ministry in Copenhagen and those who did not who did not. A characteristic of the diplomats who did break away from Copenhagen were that they were located in either allied or unoccupied countries. So they also had a very different position, so to speak, compared to the diplomats who were located in occupied Europe. So as mentioned earlier, in August 1943, the Danish government formally stepped down the state administration remained in place, and this also included the staff of the Danish foreign ministry. But a number of legations severed their ties to Copenhagen. For example, the diplomats in Sweden and Switzerland would break off ties with Copenhagen at this point in August 1943. Um, and this, I guess, was the larger part of my uh, sort of a lecture or introduction. So to cover the groundwork of uh, Danish occupation history. <laughs> um, so I now move on to the uh, second point, which was uh, Danish diplomatic role and its relation to the subject of the uh, European Jews. Um, Danish diplomacy and the European Jews in the pre-war and war period um, uh, was different and the same actually at, this, at the same time, so to speak. Uh, Danish diplomats would, were in a position to follow the persecution of the Jews in the pre-war period, but assisting Jews was not very high on the agenda for these uh, diplomats. Uh, actually, it was quite the opposite. So. The Danish attitude towards the hardships of the Jews of Europe, we can follow that through the Danish refugee policy from 1933 to 1940. It has been documented that the Danish uh, refugee policy towards Jews was continuously tightened over the period of the 1930s. And when Denmark was occupied in 1940, only a little more than 1,500 Jewish refugees were located in Denmark. The Danish government feared the rise of a so-called Jewish question coming into existence in Denmark. And there was also high unemployment rates in Denmark. So these were the main factors, be the, the main uh, um, factors in Denmark behind this very strict uh, refugee policy, but it was also a refugee policy that was supported by almost all political parties in Denmark. So we have very little opposition actually to these um, policies. But of course, we sort of need to contextualize, I think, the Danish position. And here I've done it with the rest of Scandinavia. Um, Sweden had in 1939, by the outbreak of war, they had 2,032 Jewish refugees and Norway had 260 Jewish refugees coming from Europe. 
and it was also Sweden along with Switzerland, uh, as you probably know, uh, who were responsible for securing the use of the stigmatizing J stamp in Jewish passports. So it would be a lot easier to see if Jews were trying to enter uh, their countries. Um, so in that sense, you don't have Denmark standing out, uh, but actually belongs to a group of countries which did what they could to restrain uh, Jewish uh, immigration. Um, behind these policies also lies uh, an international aspect uh, because the international community uh, failed to construct a worldwide refugee policy for Jewish refugees. And you've probably all heard of the failure of the Evian conference, uh, which basically meant that every country had to construct its own refugee policy. So in essence, then, uh, Denmark was extremely reluctant to accept Jewish refugees. And these policies would be guiding through the occupation as well. Um, and in regards to even Danish Jewish citizens who were located in Germany, we see sort of a diplomatic reluctance to assist them, even if they were hit by anti-Jewish laws in Germany. This did not uh, occur very often because um, in Germany, they were actually quite attentive to not harming international Jews or Jews from other countries. Also from 1938 uh, and onwards, Germany had uh, an international policy of excluding Jews from their foreign trade. And this meant that Danish Jewish businessmen would be fired as agents or board members of German companies operating in Denmark. And also in this aspect, we find a Danish foreign ministry that would be very reluctant to resist them out of this fear of provoking Germany. So this goes back to the uh, German school I was talking about earlier, but also, of course, the security issue of not provoking Germany. So if we move on to the diplomats themselves, they were bystanders situated in the midst of events, um, as suggested by researchers Tony Kushner and Donald Bloxham, I would argue that being a bystander is a very complex situation that you cannot divide into just two positions, passive or active, which you often see. You have to analyze the maneuverability of a bystander and, you, and very often the conditions surrounding each bystander. And both Kushner and Bloxham also uh, advises us to avoid the temptation of dividing bystanders into sinner or saint categories. Um, and if you, we all probably know uh, Schindler, Oskar Schindler, the well-known bystander, he actually moved from being a German opportunist exploiting Jews as a workforce and then move to rescue Jews uh, instead. So you could argue that he changes category from sort of a perpetrator into a bystander role, active rescuer bystander role, I should ask, add. Um, another example um, is that it posed a larger risk to assist Jews in Poland, for example, than it did in Denmark. Uh, and if we only look at the numbers, then more Jews were actually saved in Poland than in uh, Denmark. But we all know which nationality has been labeled as sinners and saints. And of course, I do recognize the examples of uh, Poles participating in genocidal acts as well. My point is that the bystander role is extremely complex and its analysis I think should not be reduced to simple categorizations as passive or activist. They can sometimes be both at the same time. You have to look at how the diplomats perceive their options, but also evaluate their maneuverability. 
So Danish diplomatic bystanders were largely guided by this perception of being restrained rather than having the possibilities to act as rescuers. Um, this position uh, changed over time and it became, I would say, more uh, restrictive. So it, if we look at um, the restraints of the time in the pre-war period, then you have the overarching restraint is the German school of Danish diplomacy. And then you have the security policy that you had to remain neutral. Denmark had no allies. You had a Danish German border issue because of the German minority within Denmark. And then you have the signature of the non-aggression pact. And then you also have the strict refugee policy and the trade exclusions. And these were of course uh, guidelines for the diplomats. And in the uh, war period, you have the German occupation as well. So the strict refugee policy of the 1930s spilled into this diplomatic arena and an unknown number of especially German Jews would contact the Danish diplomats in Berlin. And the diplomats in Berlin did assist in very few cases. And that was with the ones they had some sort of relationship to. That could be a nanny that had worked for the diplomat, or it could be a former consul that had worked for Denmark, but was Jewish. And in some cases, even family members of the diplomats. Some were even helped to other countries than uh, Denmark. So what we see here then is a country and a diplomacy that is highly shaped by its relationship to Germany. So much so that even Danish Jews in some instances were not uh, assisted. So if we move on to the uh, war period itself, um, uh, after being occupied, Danish diplomats would feel even more restrained. Uh, Danish diplomats were also restrained by the fact that there was a foreign power now occupying their country. Um, and they were aware that they could not jeopardize, jeopardize this delicate balance of cooperation that existed between Denmark and Germany. In October 1941, uh, Jews were prohibited from leaving the German area of influence. And this largely coincides with around the time that most researchers argue that the decision to murder all the Jews of Europe were taken. But this essentially would lock uh, any Jewish person within uh, occupied Europe from leaving the country they were residing in. So with this German law and the concerns of the Danish foreign ministry, that made it uh, difficult, if not impossible, actually, to relocate Jews to Denmark, even Danish Jews. Um, and the countries that might have assisted the Danish diplomats, like Sweden or Switzerland, were themselves extremely reluctant to receive Jews in the first three and a half years of the Second World War. And um, previous research has shown us that also very few Jews were allowed into Sweden from the period of January 1941 until June 1943. Only 288 Jews from Europe were allowed into uh, Sweden. And this is, of course, not counting the Jews that came from, from Norway, but from uh, other parts of Europe. So in that sense, you have a Sweden and Denmark, again, that's very similar in its very restrictive uh, policy towards letting Jews into their country. Um, for Denmark, the main restriction was set by the Germans because in 1942, uh, the Danish legation in Berlin requested the passage to Denmark of a former German Jewish consul who had worked for Denmark. His name was uh, Manfred Strauss. Um, and the German uh, rejection was cl quite clear. Uh, the Danes were scolded for even raising uh, or making this kind of request 
on behalf of a, what they called a former German Jew who was no longer implied, employed by Denmark. So there could be no doubt on how the German dictatorship perceived this, uh, this uh, issue of assisting uh, German Jews. Uh, Danish diplomats and the foreign ministry in Denmark regarded this rejection as the proverbial uh, line in the sand. A few months later, uh, this request also reached the Danish anti-Semitic newspaper. Uh, I just have uh, sort of an example on your screen right now. And this uh, newspaper would label the Danish diplomats in Berlin as Jewish lackeys who were just attempting to save their Jewish friends. Um, so this basically meant that the Gestapo was probably monitoring the Danish diplomats, but also that their dealings, the Danish diplomats' dealings with the German foreign ministry were not as confidential as they might have thought. Um, and these episodes essentially stopped any attempts at aiding foreign Jews. The German has had drawn a line and the diplomats probably needed to be even more careful in these matters and their daily dealings. The question of Danish Jews residing in Europe was another issue. And to contextualize this, we might just want to pause and think of how foreign ministries in the present also focus on the subjects or their citizens of their own state. We can just recall the most recent catastrophe, and you might remember the news reports of your own country, which all, always focuses on how many, for example, Poles or Americans or Germans who were in the cat catastrophe area and how many of them has been brought home. I'm not saying that this is the way it should be, but rather this is how diplomacy works and this is also how it worked then. Um, the Danish foreign ministry would attempt to aid Danish Jews residing in Europe, but in the beginning of 1942, they were reluctant to assist Jews who had become Danish citizens through marriage. So the ministry ultimately set a restriction for Jews they would assist to 1935. And that, of course, is the year when the Nuremberg laws were passed, defining who were Jewish and who were not. So this means that if you had become a Danish citizen by marriage after 1935, you could actually not expect the assistance of the Danish foreign ministry. Um, but then in the beginning of 1943, the Germans requested all nations they regarded allied or neutral to accept the return of Jews of their nationality. So this meant that, for example, Jews holding a Danish or Swedish citizenship could return to their home country. And here you have a, here the restraints were let go in Denmark. So all were helped no matter when they had gained uh, citizenship. Uh, and the Danish foreign ministry was uh, in most cases successful in getting all Jews that had a Danish passport securely to Denmark in this late, time of, of war, the, the spring of 1943. Altogether, this was around 55 Jews who came back to Denmark, and most of them later relocated to, to Sweden. So there was no longer any restraints as to when a person had become a Danish national. So this was a surprising window of opportunity, which in most cases proved for a successful relocation to Denmark. But of course, it was also a window of opportunity that was decided by the Germans. So lastly, I will show some of the instances where these restraints were broken and safe passage was secured for at least most Danish Jews in Europe. I've just actually mentioned one of the larger ones. But there were also two extraordinary episodes of rescue I would like to mention. And the first one was in Norway, where the Jews were deported in December 1942. Um, before deportation, uh, Denmark, among other countries, was asked to make sure Danish Jews were relocated to Germany. And this had to be done extremely quickly, so quickly that the Danish consul 
Hans Henning Schröder actually boarded the ship Donau, which you should see on your screen now. Um, the ship was used to transport the Norwegian Jews to Auschwitz, but he actually managed to physically remove the two Danish Jews from the ship uh, due to this cooperation with uh, Denmark and Germany, this was possible. Um, we also have another, I think it's even more remarkable rescue by the Danish consul in Hungary, who managed to assist six and maybe even more Jews uh, from deportation in Hungary in 1944, possibly with the assistance of uh, Swedish diplomacy. And it's quite remarkable because the Danish government no longer functioned and the delegation basically ran its own affairs at this point. So here you could say we have a diplomat that went through the restraints and acted on his own. And that's very rare in the Danish case. So just to finalize here then, uh, Denmark did not have a Raoul Wallenberg or a Vados group uh, the Danish diplomatic bystanders felt largely restrained by working for an occupied slash neutral country with a history of restraint towards Jewish refugees. Uh, in context, Denmark's and Sweden's reactions towards foreign Jews were actually very similar until the deportation attempt of the Danish Jews in October 1943 because then Sweden opened it bought its borders for the refugees from Denmark. And it's also here you see that Sweden began a much more active rescue policy regarding the Jews of Europe. This change, I believe, was not possible for Denmark, who instead would become much more like occupied Norway without a government and a rising resistance. Um, but one can only hope that future research, for example, into the actual passport lists at delegations in, for example, Switzerland, might prove me wrong. But in essence, Danish diplomats did very little due to a host of restraints they felt they had in regards to Jews who were not Danish. Yet they did manage to secure passage for almost anyone holding a Danish passport. Altogether, I have found that 21 foreign Jews were rescued by Danish diplomats in this manner, which is of course a meager result, but for most it probably meant that they were saved from being murdered during the Holocaust. In regards to Jews holding a Danish passport, almost all Jews were saved uh, because of this, and I would argue that number is just below 100, who resided somewhere in occupied Europe. We even have one that resided in Katowice, but who was rescued during the war. So that concludes my uh, talk for today. And I would like to say thank you if you stayed on for the whole time. If you have uh, any further questions, please don't uh, hesitate uh, to contact me on the email that you see on your screen today. And if you miss it, I uh, am sure the Pilecki Institute will provide you with contact details if uh, necessary. So uh, thank you very much for listening in. Sytuację w czasie II wojny światowej w tej części Europy, o której do tej pory nie mieliśmy okazji się przyglądać, oczywiście mówimy o Danii. Zanim przejdziemy do następnej części, jeszcze przypominam, że mogą Państwo korzystać z tłumaczenia na język polski, a także zachęcam do dalszego zadawania pytań. Zachęcam, żeby pytania do naszych prelegentów wpisywać w przestrzeni pytania i odpowiedzi, która znajduje się w dolnym pasku. A teraz bardzo proszę o zabranie głosu doktora Johna Cornell. Bardzo proszę. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Amelia. <coughs> Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank Dr. Viera for a uh, very interesting, excellent presentation. Um, thank you. I think that uh, we often look at the subject of rescues of Jews in occupied Europe from the vantage of rescuers' motivations. 
what led them to undertake what were often extremely dangerous actions. And you have talked about this in terms of, of the, the bystanders and the, 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 the difficulty of, of defining who was a bystander, how it, when it becomes, when it's passive or when it's active. And I think that this is always very difficult to pin down or to predict. Uh, and it often seems to come down to very personal histories or, or a confluence of many different factors. Um, but another way of looking at it, as Dr. Biera has done here, is from the vantage of what constrains or stops people from acting upon uh, humanitarian or altruistic motives that they might have. Uh, and I think this is a very valuable uh, fact to take. Uh, because it concerns larger structural conditions that are to some degree more predictable and perhaps even in some way controllable. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, approach to take. And I think the, the case of Denmark is of course particularly interesting in this because it reflects both a certain willingness to help and protect their Jewish population, uh, which is almost unique, um, uh, and that appears to have been quite widely shared. And at the same time, of course, very clear restraints as you have described uh, quite fully um, presented by their, their difficult position with Nazi Germany and their you know, cooperationist policies. Now the, the history of Denmark's relations with Nazi Germany is certainly uh, filled with controversy, at least within the Danish historiography uh, itself. Uh, no less than, than with any other nation that is embroiled in the, the Second World War. Uh, and of course, this controversy has much to do with post-war politics, with the shaping of competing war narratives, uh, and also I think with the universal coming to grips with the meaning of the Holocaust and with all of our, our shared failures in stopping or even mitigating it. Um, but in all of this, I think the Danish case remains quite remarkable and unique for a number of reasons, uh, which are worth underlining. Um, one remarkable point, of course, is the stubborn refusal of the Danish government to implement the anti-Jewish policies or regulations against their own Jewish population during the period of cooperation, despite uh, what one must assume was a, a great um, deal of, of uh, pressure from Nazi Germany. Um, and just a comparison in speaking of the Polish exile government in London, uh, the historian David Engel used the term universe of obligation. Uh, he was arguing that the Polish government for the, for the Polish government, its own Jewish citizens were excluded from this universe of obligation. I would of course argue with him on that. Um, but in the Danish case, one could say that clearly Danish Jews fell firmly within the governments and, and the people's universe of obligation, uh, which is, as I say, in a way, uh, unique and extraordinary. Uh, another remarkable point uh, is, of course, the widespread participation and cooperation of the Danish population, both in respecting the rights that were upheld by the government during the cooperation period, and particularly in carrying out the rescue operation uh, in October of 1943. Again, this is not without some controversy, uh, Denmark was, of course, not without its own share of anti-Semitism, and you have talked about the, the uh, anti-immigrationist policies and, and the refusal to help uh, refugees. Um, but the remarkable fact remains that some 98% of Denmark's Jewish population was rescued in this and in other, the other operations, and with the cooperation of a broad spectrum of the Danish citizenry. But I think the very success of the Danish rescue operation raises some very interesting issues concerning the difficulties and the failures in rescuing the European Jewish population from the Holocaust from a, more, from a broader perspective. It's issues which I think Dr. Guerra has discussed very importantly in his presentation in terms of restraints placed on Danish diplomats in undertaking the broader rescue actions. Uh, and certainly one of the many factors that made the Danish rescue operation successful, um, <clears throat> one, <clears throat> sorry, one vital factor was the proximity of a neutral country, Sweden, and its willingness to accept the Danish refugees. And as you've said, this was not a given. 
uh, Sweden had refused to do the same for Norway's pop Jewish population the year before. But fortunately, the situation had changed enough by the autumn of, of, of 43 that, uh, so importantly, Danish Jews had somewhere to go. And I think that this touches on one of the crucial underlying problems of the Holocaust and of the Allies' response to it, which was, what was one to do with the Jewish refugees once they had actually been rescued and removed from dangerous lands? Um, and this is really a, a very serious underlying issue. There are many examples of rescue operations undertaken uh, in Poland and in other occupied territories, uh, which sometimes came very close to being realized, only to be stymied by the adamant refusal of some British or American official or other uh, to allow the refugees in question to be transported to Palestine, to Britain, or to some other allied or allied controlled territory. It happens again and again. There's many stories of, of ships being turned away uh, at the last moment. So, in fact, there's this great reluctance, not just on the part of, of the Danish government, uh, but on the part of the allies in general to take in Jewish refugees. Uh, and this, of course, had been dramatically underlined only months before the Danish rescue operation in the infamous Bermuda Conference of April 1943, when the American and British officials uh, simply reaffirmed their absolute refusal to raise immigration quotas or to allow refugees into Palestine. And this, of course, continued the anti-immigration policies that uh, had undermined the Avian Conference, which Dr. Biera has referred to. So underlying all of this, the failure of the allied powers, uh, not just the Danish, but uh, all of the allied powers and the neutral nations to undertake the rescue of European Jews in a more substantial way, uh, was surely this overwhelming fear of waves of Jewish immigrants that would in their minds have inevitably have followed such rescue operations. And as I said, as Dr. Biera has discussed here, this is no different in the Danish case. Uh, and immigration policies uh, have been, in fact, one of the, the sort in, in Denmark have been one of the sources of controversy uh, in their historical narrative of the war. Um, but I would say that this is remained really one of the most persistent and intractable problems of the 20th, of the whole of the 20th century, and now really the 21st century as well. This fear that giving aid and shelter to refugees would lead to uncontrollable waves of immigrants. So when we talk about uh, constraints or restraints upon action for diplomats, um, this surely uh, has to be one of the, the, the largest of those. Um, I think that the comparisons which Dr. Biera alluded to, uh, the Wadosh group in Bern and Raoul Wallenberg in Budapest are particularly interesting in this aspect because in both of these cases, this problem of where to send the Jews that were rescued was essentially sidestepped. In Wallensburg's case, which was very much, uh, of course, an 11th hour rescue at the uh, very last moment when clearly uh, Germany was, was falling, rescuees were given passports, but they weren't expected to, to go to Sweden. They, were, they, they remained in safe houses in Budapest uh, to be hidden until uh, the impending end, end of the war. In the case of the Wadosh group, uh, while at first it might have been expected that the South American passports would get recipients out of Axis or occupied territories, uh, in the end, it was really simply the fact of holding a South American passport or even just the copy of one that was enough to change the Jewish holder's status and to uh, enable them to avoid being sent to a death camp. They, for the most part, or in many cases, remained in, in, in interned in camps, um, but they, they had a, a different, a safer status. So neither of these operations really depended upon allied or neutral nations agreeing to receive Jewish refugees. So um, I think my first question uh, might therefore be, that if we are to consider that it was simply not possible for diplomats, Danish or otherwise, uh, to provide stateless Jewish refugees with pathways to safe havens, 
because of this almost universal anti-immigration policy uh, and because of their cooperation with Germany as well. What other ways would there have been for them to conduct some sort of rescue missions? What, what did they really, what options did they have? Um, and one area uh, I'd be interested in knowing more about in this is the possible role of Danish diplomats in simply passing, passing along information to the allies, uh, whether information about the situation of Jews or simply wartime intelligence more generally. Uh, and how involved were they in this? Um, another, I think another interesting point of comparison with Wadosh and Wallenberg is that in both those cases, of course, their respective government, governments uh, did not have their hands tied by forced cooperation with Nazi Germany in the same way, of course, that the, Dan the, that the Danish government did. Um, although to some extent they were constrained by the need to maintain neutra neutrality, uh, even for Wadosh who had to operate in neutral Switzerland. So I, I would wonder then in the Danish case, how attitudes towards rescuing non-national Jews might have changed in cases where Danish diplomats were more removed from the control of Copenhagen. You've talked about this a, a little bit uh, and, and uh, more removed from the cooperationist government. Um, and of course, and you talked about the, 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 the Danish legation in Washington. And of course, there's not much they could have done directly in terms of, of rescuing Jews, but were they involved in any way uh, in discussing or demanding uh, rescue actions? Um, did they have a, a, a broader sense of, of what uh, Denmark's obligations towards European Jews might have been, uh, just from the fact of their being uh, more removed? In fact, as you said, uh, cut off from, from the Danish government. I think it would be particularly interesting in this case uh, to see how the legations in Switzerland and Portugal reacted. And I know you've said that you have not had a uh, uh, been able to, to research these so far, but I, I hope that you will have a chance uh, to study those because I think it would provide a, a very interesting counterpoint to what Danish legations were able to do in German occupied areas, which would be quite a different situation. Uh, I think a corollary to this is that both the Polish and Swedish diplomats and their governments uh, were in contact and close proximity to world Jewish organizations and were therefore able to work quite closely with these and also to be under uh, a fair amount of pressure from Jewish organizations to, to act. This would have been more difficult for the Danish government, of course, being directly uh, tied to uh, the Nazi foreign ministry. But I wonder uh, if there were any connections, formal or informal, between Danish diplomats in neutral or allied countries and Jewish groups? Or was the position of the Danish government as a Nazi cooperator or even they might say collaborator uh, enough to prevent this from happening? And were there other Danes, perhaps businessmen, for example, traveling uh, around throughout the um, occupied territories and, and neutral countries as well? Uh, did they have any informal diplomatic ties that might have uh, promoted action on behalf of, of Danish or non-Danish Jews? And if not, what would have stopped them from doing so? Uh, and all of this, I think, just to, to kind of finish up, uh, brings me back to the, the notion of one's uh, universe of obligation. Because diplomats, after all, represent their governments, who in turn represent the interests of their citizens. Um, so a fundamental question always remains, who falls within that nation's universe of obligation? And I think this is, you could see it as a kind of a, 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 a positive thing. Who are you supposed to rescue? But it's also a kind of a negative. It's a restraint really on the actions of individual diplomats and government officials, because in the end, they have to act in the perceived interests of, of their peoples. Uh, so if Danish Jews belong to this, within this universe of obligation, and those who married them before 1935, um, but others, of course, did not. Uh, what, what, it, what could bring about a, a change in this to expand that universe to include others in dire need? Did this become more possible in the Danish case after August of 1943? Uh, did Danish diplomats' conception of who should be saved 
change in any way once they were no longer so tightly held by the cooperationist policies. Um, so those those are my 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 uh, like my questions and my reactions. I hope that is of of, of some help. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. As you say, we don't know much about Danish history, but it is it's, it is a very uh, unique uh, situation and one that I think reflects quite interestingly upon uh, situations of other occupied and, and unoccupied countries. Thank you uh, very much for your uh, comments, uh, Dr. Cornell. Um, and also for providing, uh, I think, an important international aspect to the lecture by mentioning, for example, the Bermuda Conference and also that uh, the British and the United States were also uh, quite reluctant for quite a period uh, to receive Jews from, from, uh, from Europe. Um, you asked me, I think, five or six uh, different questions. So. <laughs> If I don't uh, remember or cover them all, then uh, please uh, feel free to uh, re-ask them. Uh, you asked on the role of uh, information in general uh, and also both on what happened uh, during in, in the war effort, but also what happened regarding uh, information on Jews or the Jewish uh, destiny. Uh, I would say they... <sighs> because of the occupation, they couldn't write that much down. But I know that a lot of um, a lot of um, oral information was given. Uh, the, the diplomat in Berlin would from 1941, he would fly home to Denmark every three months and make oral reports instead of written reports. Uh, but of course, some do exist. Uh, I found uh, some through uh, personal files. So if they were to assist, say, a Danish Jew in Belgium, they usually would have contact with this person from already from the, uh, the onset of the war. So you can follow what they write about this person, that this person has been interned, and now we have managed to rescue this person. So actually, I would say they had... Uh, quite good information on what was happening to the Jews, especially in Western Europe. Of course, the legations in Eastern Europe were, uh, or I should rather say the heartland of the Holocaust. So the Baltics, uh, the Russia and also Poland were all closed when uh, they entered into war with uh, Germany. But I this has not been researched, but I do believe that they also had close ties to Swedish diplomats. And it has not really been researched what Sweden actually knew about uh, the Holocaust. So, um, but if they knew, and they probably knew a lot more because they were had a more open uh, diplomacy, they also had diplomats in Moscow, of course, uh, who would have had access to the reports released by, um, the uh, Soviet Union on the, for example, the Babi Yar massacre and so forth. I think the Swedes knew that. And I think what the Swedes knew, the Danes knew, because the Danish legation in Stockholm would probably gain that sort of information. And then they could travel to Copenhagen and, and um, really uh, pass on that information. So I think they knew more than I have actually found out. <laughs> But, uh, but I think they were, they were quite well informed, but at the same time, uh, you have this question of what does it mean to have the, uh, um, the purpose of murdering all the Jews of Europe? What does that actually mean? So I think, and that has also been showed in, in research that it was only after the war that people really realized how horrible this actually was, uh, how Auschwitz really functioned and all the other extermination camps. I think that that perception was only fully understood uh, afterwards, after the war. Um, in regards to wartime information, I think they had uh, a fair amount of access to that sort of information as well. And I think that again would be have been through Sweden, actually. And then you also have 
uh, a rising resistance in Denmark that would also gain uh, information through uh, other channels, of course, through the ally channels. Um, I hope that covers the information part of, of your question. And then um, you had a question about um, the diplomats who were sort of removed from Copenhagen and uh, who were in unoccupied or allied countries. And I think in the beginning, they felt uh, very close to Copenhagen and then over time departed. And if Kaufman, who uh, signed over Greenland to America in 1941, was actually fired by the Danish foreign ministry, but the American government would not accept this resignation. So Kaufman would actually live on the grace of uh, Washington, uh, accepting him. So I, do, I think uh, he couldn't really do that much, actually, other than uh, basically be uh, you know, um, a bystander to what was happening in the States. He didn't have much weight, especially in the beginning of the war. I think he gained more through time, of course. And um, then you also asked about Switzerland and Portugal, and that's I haven't researched those countries, so I can't really say that much um about uh what they did but i i think one keynote is that the danish envoy in switzerland did not break ties with copenhagen until august 1943 which is actually quite late i think so he remained loyal to copenhagen and i would i would probably argue that he felt the same restraints at the uh, as the other diplomats but of course i don't know uh for sure um, and then you had the question if they were in contact with the Jewish organizations. Uh, I found um, traces of that in the, in the uh, Danish uh, National Archives about the diplomat who was in uh, Great Britain, in London. He actually had access to information from the Jewish organizations. But he uh, severed ties with Copenhagen in, um, by the signing of the anti kerman turn Pact, which would be in November 1941. But he would, he, had, he would gain knowledge from these organizations and actually be invited to sort of uh, evenings at these uh, organizations. Uh, they had evenings where they would hold talks, etc. But I, I couldn't... Uh, find out if he actually participated or not. <laughs> so that's quite important, I think. But but he would have access to some of that information. Whether that reached Copenhagen, I actually don't know. Um, but uh, the the and then you had the um, question about the no, that was about the connection. Um, then you had the uh, businessmen. If they would enter into informal actions, I own, I've only, I only know of very few businessmen who did uh, actually go into these informal actions, but we do have some uh, examples. There's uh, the pre-war. If you had, uh, say, a higher-ranking uh, Jewish person working in your factory in Germany, then there's one example of relocating this person to uh, the Netherlands, actually. Uh, and in that way, uh, securing him and then uh, sort of uh, sidestepping the uh, anti-Jewish laws in Germany. And you also have a few examples. I think it's from an entrepreneurial company who in 1941 actually assists uh, former employ Jewish employees uh, and then uh, they come to Sweden. But it has not been uh, thoroughly researched in a more systematic manner. This is just people who have uh, bumped into it researching a separate company, actually. So, but it did happen, um, at least. Um, and then you had the, um, the obligation to help and could it become more possibly possible to help? I, I, would, I would argue that uh, the diplomats in occupied Europe felt very restrained by uh, the, their ties to the uh, Danish government. Whether they 
acted in a very different manner afterwards. I'm, I'm actually unsure because how could you um, issue a new Danish passport to someone if you were not, now you were sort of a, maybe you were considered a, a belligerent country to Germany. So would Germany even accept these passports as valid documents? And I think um, maybe the Hungarian case uh, sort of underscores this as he relied on the people he helped would be assisted by actually gaining Swedish uh, passports. So there's a question is, what kind of document would German bureaucracy actually accept uh, in this matter? And, and I think they would accept Danish passports until uh, August 1943, but the question remains if they would after August 1943. Uh, of course, this is also, I think, a case that would be very interesting to, to test in the future. I hope I've covered all your questions, uh, Dr. Cornell. Otherwise, please uh, feel free to uh, re-ask them. Oh, you have very much. Um, the only thing that I, I, I was uh, wondering about in terms of intelligence was whether uh, Danes were able to actually pass intelligence on to uh, allies in any way, if they had any kind of underground organizations that could take information that they could easily get from, from uh, their, their freedom to uh, act within Germany uh, and pass it on to the allies. Um, that was... Yes, I think um, that was probably the case, but if they would pass it on to the Allies, it would probably have been through Swedish diplomats, because the network of Swedish diplomacy, I think, was much more coherent than the Danish one was. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, they would have had to pass it along uh, to to um, to other people. Of course, that could have happened, but but uh, I don't know. You would have uh, to know from the other end, I, I exactly. suppose, from yes. the British British sources uh, whether they said stated that they received certain information from Danish representatives. Yeah, and it, maybe the Swedish ones would be the ones they received most from, I would think, because they, there was actually an, a line of communication that they could have between Sweden and London, uh, yes. uh, also for Denmark. Actually, uh, actually, people, uh, there were some people that has just gained uh, a research grant for examining exactly uh, this question. So mm. hopefully in a couple of years, we'll, we'll know a lot more about that. Uh, that they'll, be they'll be, yeah, they'll be looking at the information that were gained by uh, Danes in both uh, London, but also Stockholm. That's their two uh, focus centers, so to speak, in this uh, research project. Thank, thank you very much for your answer. Bardzo dziękuję. Dziękuję doktorowi Cornell za poszerzenie naszej perspektywy badawczej dzisiaj poprzez te uwagi i też pytania. I dziękuję także doktorowi Bier za, za odpowiedzi. Proszę Państwa, mamy jeszcze dwa pytania od publiczności. Ja odczytam te pytania tak, jak zostały zadane, a więc w języku angielskim. I też przypominam Państwu, że mogą Państwo skorzystać z tłumaczenia na język polski. Pytania te są, jak rozumiem, skierowane do doktora Biera, ale jeżeli doktor John Cornell chciałby coś dodać, to oczywiście też jak najbardziej zachęcamy. Pierwsze pytanie. So a question to Dr. Biere. What were the possibilities of help to refugees of the Danish diplomats that were in the neutral countries and disobeyed the governmental policy? Uh, did they play any significant role in help actions, Dr. Biera? Bardzo proszę. I think, unfortunately, I have to say that uh, the Danish diplomats uh, did not play a significant role in rescue. Uh, they did rescue some people through their contacts with other diplomats. So for example, one of the former consuls of Denmark was actually held by the, the, uh, the Danish uh, diplomat in uh, Germany as late as 1940. Uh, and he was relocated to Switzerland. 
And I think that is one case where you have a diplomat that goes outside of the restraints he felt he had to assist a former employee, which I assume he had a lot of uh, contact with. And also you had, as I mentioned, the case of a nanny that had worked for a family. They were also able to assist uh, her in, uh, in, uh, in leaving Germany in the 1930s. But I don't see a mass assistance on the Danish diplomats in, in Germany, uh, which I believe only would have been possible uh, before the occupation of, um, of, of Denmark. And that is due to this extremely strict refugee policy that Denmark had. Some of the diplomats would actually appeal to the Danish foreign ministry to let this person into Denmark. But I would say in 99% of the cases, the Danish foreign ministry and the Danish justice ministry would reject this request, even though it came from uh, Danish diplomats from uh, or working in Germany. Dziękuję bardzo. A może doktor Kronau chciałby jeszcze coś dodać w kontekście tego pytania albo jakoś się odnieść? Jeżeli nie, to, to przejdę do następnego pytania. Dobrze. Yeah, I, I would I would just say that in, in terms of, of, of uh, Danish diplomats in the neutral countries, I would I would say I would guess that they were in uh, a, a more difficult position in a way than, than even Polish diplomats or, or others, because uh, on the one hand, uh, it would seem like they would have more that they could do because they, they were representing a government that was cooperating with the Germans. But on the other hand, uh, they, as, as Dr. Biotta said, they were so constrained by this, 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 uh, uh, this overriding concern not to uh, uh, aggravate the Germans. That, really their hands were tied. They would have had to break ties with, with Copenhagen in order to really carry out any uh, rescue operations, I would, I would guess. And in doing so, then of course, they would have lost all of their power as diplomats. Uh, that's my thought. <laughs> Uh, do you know how the other ethnic groups, for example, Poles, uh, who came to the, um, sorry, I will just, to, to the country, I mean, Denmark, uh, before the war, uh, how they were treated in Denmark during the Second World War? Um, were they deported or were they allowed to, to stay? Thank you for that uh, question. I think, uh, as I mentioned, there was about, um, I don't have an overview of the ethnic groups who came to uh, Denmark before the war or the, um, you could also call them the national groups. Uh, I don't have an overview of that, but there was a Polish minority uh, residing in Denmark when a uh, war broke out. I'm unsure how many Poles came to, who were not Jewish, came to Denmark be before uh, the outbreak of war. But there was a Polish uh, minority in Denmark who actually uh, were not deported or anything else, as far as I know. They were allowed to live uh, where they lived and uh, keep on working in their farming institutions uh, where they were uh, working in the southern part of, uh, of, of Sealand and in Denmark. Uh, they took down uh, sort of their, um, what do you call it, their, their markings, markings of their organizations. They also had their own flags. They took that down in an attempt not to provoke the Germans, but uh, I have not bumped into anything suggesting that Poles were persecuted in, in Denmark in some way, even though uh, Denmark was occupied by Germany. There are a few example of examples of Poles joining the Danish resistance movement. Of course, they placed themselves in, a, in another position. And I know they were targeted, of course, uh, for, um, by the Gestapo and so forth, like the rest of the Danish resistance movement would be. Um, of course, there 
is also um, some Jewish Poles that came to Denmark, but most Jews, as you already know, uh, were lucky to uh, flee to Sweden in October 1943. And that, would, that was also the case with the foreign Jews. There is no discrepancy between Danish and foreign Jews in this period, which I find actually quite remarkable. So most of the, uh, the foreign Jews who resided in Denmark would actually manage to uh, be included in this uh, flight to uh, Sweden. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Maybe Dr. Cornell would like to add something else. Okay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the last question, and then our conversation will be coming to an end. Jeszcze raz serdecznie dziękuję doktorowi Bier za ten no jakże interesujący wykład, który rzuca światło, tak jak wspomniałam, na tę część Europy, o której do tej pory nie mieliśmy zbyt często okazję mówić. Także dziękuję bardzo doktorowi Cronau za te wszystkie cenne, cenne pytania. Ja chciałam też Państwa serdecznie zaprosić na kolejne nasze spotkanie, które odbędzie się za tydzień, to znaczy 18 maja. Jako główny referent wystąpi Anna Ciałowicz z Instytutu Pileckiego, która przedstawi temat stosunek Żydów do Polaków na podstawie ksiąg pamięci. A koreferentem będzie profesor Monika Adamczyk-Garbowska z Uniwersytetu Marii Kiryś Skłodowskiej w Lublinie. Spotkanie poprowadzi dr Agnieszka Konik z Instytutu Pileckiego. Szanowni Państwo, serdecznie zachęcam do udziału w tym spotkaniu, które odbędzie się za tydzień. Pozdrawiam Państwa serdecznie, życzę wszystkiego dobrego i do widzenia.